The Graduate Institute at St. John's College explores the great books of the West or the East, now online or in person at our Annapolis, Maryland, or Santa Fe, New Mexico campuses. Learn more at sjc.edu. Welcome to the Harper's Podcast. I'm your host, Violet Luca. In the April issue, Lisa Wells, author of Believers, Making a Life at the End of the World, meditates on the life of the modern-day pilgrim Anne Sieben. Sieben, who formerly worked in nuclear remediation, has spent the past 15 years walking more than 45,000 miles through 56 different countries in pilgrimages dedicated to God and various saints. Sieben's extremely stripped-down, free-form existence also reminded Wells of her own life before having a child, and forced Wells to confront the part of her that wished she could return, however briefly, to that freedom. In this episode, I spoke with Wells about experiencing the numinous as a secular person, the parallels between motherhood, pilgrimage, and writing, the role of gender, and the histories of pilgrimage. The title of your essay is Numinous Strangers, and this concept of, you know, finding the numinous through others recurs throughout the essay. I mean, and and in what sense do you understand the word numinous? You know, it's been used in slightly different ways by Rudolf Otto, Carl Jung, Marcel Ilade, C.S. Lewis. So could you could you describe what exactly you mean by that it, 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 acknowledging that it's kind of a slippery term and what it means to find the numinous as a secular and not terribly religious person i don't situate it in any of those folks usage because i'm not familiar with any of them but <laughs> uh I th- I tend to think of it, and i don't even know if this is like i'm stretching the definition but i tend to think of it as a kind of almost like a physical quality, like a glo- like a, like a, a, like an ectoplasm or something <laughs> that's like, um, on the ordinary objects of phenomenal reality. That's what I'm going to say right now. So the idea that sometimes there are people whose faces stick out extra on the street when you pass them, like there's a kind of, I don't know, like a, extra dimensional magnetism. And aside from those sorts of encounters, do you seek out the numinous or how do you experience it? Is it something you kind of can't put your your finger on or what does that transformation look like for you, that experience? There's a lot of things that could be said. <laughs> like you could say that all of all of creation is numinous all of all beings and all things and it's our task Mm. to perceive that kind of you know sacred quality in our lives however ordinary or extraordinary but i also think the psychologists or the psychoanalysts might say part of what makes their face draw us in the street or like what makes why we were drawn to some people over others has more to do with whatever unfinished business we're projecting onto the environment Hmm. Uh, and that there might be a kind of bite fits the wound quality to, you know, who we're drawn to, which I didn't really get into in the essay, but I was sort of had in the back of my mind with Anne because poor Anne had to bear so many of my projections and like was like calling to mind my former life, as I talk about in the essay Mm -hmm. of, of as being sort of, um, at liberty to to move but she also sort of reminded me of my mother <laughs> mm. and so we were kind of working that out while you know in the reporting there was no like easy way to kind of shoehorn that into the essay but um <laughs> how could there and, be <laughs> yeah right but I do de- I kind of detect this in my meaningful interactions with all people you know whether I'm really vibing kind of like feeling like I'm connecting with someone in a in the sense of agree- like we're agreeing or something, mm-hmm. or if there's friction, right? Because that can be really fruitful if you're willing to uh, dig in and find out what's producing it. You know, somebody like Anne, who has stripped away everything else about herself, who is a mendicant pilgrim that literally carries nothing except for, you know, 
the clothes on her back uh, 99% of the time. She's somebody who is the most susceptible to being projected upon because there's nothing, there's nothing you could kind of sort of grasp onto, right? It's like this, this opposite, the opposing yeah. effect, because it's such an extreme position to hold. <laughs> you know, I hadn't thought about, I certainly, I, I, I did pick up on that idea that she would be, and I think I even say something to that effect explicitly in the piece that she would be the object that we project upon because of her exactly that, because she's so um, pared down um, and fleeting right in and mm -hmm. out. But I hadn't, th I hadn't really thought of her as, as a kind of mobile analyst, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and she's not in her affect. She's not a blank screen. Like she's lived these extraordinary experiences sidebar it was kind of one of the hardest things about writing the piece is that it's just not the scale is tough to get right because any one of these pilgrimages she's gone on a writer for outside magazine could have sold a book about you know and she's yeah. gone on like dozens of them so um it was just hard to know at what level to even work with the material but um so for a person who's had such extraordinary experiences um, and adding to that the fact that she's had no no like material resources really with her, just her wits, and adding to that the fact that she was walking through conflict zones at some points or like remote wildernesses in winter, and she's a woman. I mean, there were so many factors that made make her life extraordinary. But she likes to shoot the shit and crack a couple foamers, you know. So it's <laughs> yeah, she she's not a blank screen in those terms, I guess I should say. Uh, but just by virtue of the fact that she's not um, sort of locatable based on anything that anyone has already has in their repertoire of experience, I think does invite projection. You introduce Anne at the Camino de Santiago, which she claims has largely become a touristic venture where pilgrims move around uh, like, quote, an economic widget because there are like yellow arrows pointing the way. And this is kind of funny. This is it's just funny to think of. Oh yeah, these these are touristic pilgrims, but but also because pilgrimages were a precursor to modern day vacations. You know, someone and their family would travel to a relic or try to reach Jerusalem and then get shaken down by some guys pretending to be the Knights Templar or whatever. So, how did you feel that history fits? how there is this weird kind of fluctuating relationship between pilgrimage and secularism. I mean, you're right to point that out. I think a lot of the sort of municipal infrastructure uh, in those parts of the world grew up around the pilgrimage routes, you know, and there were bridge building projects in order to facilitate it because it was always an industry. That's totally right. Um, also, uh, pilgrims were some of the first super spreaders during the Black Plague. Oh, you know, I believe it. Carry, carry these infected <laughs> fleas from house to house. And back then when they would stay in an, al I mean, they didn't call them albergues, but the little guest houses um, that are super cheap that people continue to stay in today, they would, people would sleep communally on these hay mattresses where you'd have like 15 dudes mostly um, swapping fleas and probably all, all manner of pestilence. So uh, <laughs> anyhow, I, you know, to be fair to Anne, I think the Camino, it's hard to escape the urge to, to be touristic, or maybe like there are a lot of forces that are kind of pulling you in that direction, but she really views it more as a mindset. So hmm. um, are you kind of giving yourself up to the experience or are you putting your money on the table and demanding that in exchange you receive a certain kind of experience. So as I understand it, that's kind of how she frames the touristic pilgrim thing. And she even implicates herself. Like the, the reason she doesn't count her first Camino is because she, she viewed herself as a, as a touristic pilgrim. And of course there are still like mortal dangers on the Camino people die on it you know, not all the time, but I think at least a few people a year, sometimes from heart attack and sometimes by being hit by cars or, um, you know, infamously a woman was abducted and murdered there a few years ago, a woman from Phoenix. So I hope I, you know, I wouldn't want to frame it as a cakewalk. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't 
because mortality comes up a lot in this piece as well. You know, not just in like a religious sense that at one point I think Anne says, you know, I would love to be martyred. But, you know, yeah. there is this <laughs> constant possibility of fatal violence and you know yeah. what what makes Anne, I think you know you mentioned this before what, what what makes Anne such a provocative character and your desire to join her is that that threat of violence comes from the fact that women are taught from childhood not to go places by themselves right yeah. and you know there's this chapter in your book believers about trackers and how you had this training in, in in sort of tracking and wilderness skills and that that world is kind of dripping with this really icky masculinity and this kind of like bullshitting and be like oh yeah i totally know the, what those tracks are doing so like yeah, yeah. i got a machismo the question of gender fits into the act of pilgrimage and also your understanding of what Anne is doing and what you would like to do. Yeah, great. I mean, thanks for asking. I, I And I had a long kind of riff on this too that didn't make the final cut. So it's an important piece of her story whether she likes it or not because she's constantly being asked, how do you protect yourself? Have you been attacked? Aren't you afraid? I mean, these are the the stories, the questions that she's asked and the reason the questions are so charged have to do with the fact that she's a woman. And, you know, whether we're talking about the, the lives of the saints or the Arthurian legends, you know, like the kind of literatures that she's operating in don't typically involve women going places and doing things like women are protected by men at most. So when I was in Asheville, I heard the pilgrimage scholar George Greenia give a lecture about basically bad behavior on the Camino back in medieval times. And because pilgrims died a lot back then on the Camino, and he described them as free agents. They were beyond the purview of the law, both in terms of what they did. So whether that's having extramarital affairs or drunkenness, robbing people, whatever, and what was done to them. So if you were murdered on the road, you know, tough luck. And when I heard that, I kind of got a chill because mainly he was referencing men because that's mo mostly who was pilgriming back then. But um, it made me think how that is sort of the attitude toward women who dare to, <laughs> you know, hit the road alone Yeah. to this day. And uh, when I, I pressed Anne about this, you know, like, and she, I wouldn't say she's resistant to the question, but I think maybe kind of resented it and kept insisting that... <laughs> You know, on the contrary, she is the her demographic is like the best equipped to be a pilgrim because I think she said, who can you trust more than a small middle aged woman? You know, you're not going to trust a giant guy who comes and knocks on the door because that's going to be threatening. And then, you know, perhaps uh, a younger woman would be more likely to be a target. So there's kind of a a, a bit of an insistence on you know, her refrain, which is that God protects the pilgrims among us. And that's sort of the final word. And that that's probably not literally true, but definitely a soothing mantra to hold in mind, I think. Yeah. And I mean, also, to at least in, in most Western societies, including the one that we're podcasting from, middle-aged women are kind of invisible if they're not married if they don't have children if they don't do certain things and so to do to make this sort of radical act of pilgrimage is she's she's putting herself out there but also she's kind of hidden in a way yeah that's a really interesting reading of it and she also talked about how she leveraged her age and gender a lot um because she was walking through so many military checkpoints or, you know, in conflict zones where, as she related it, um, a lot of the soldiers are like 18 year old conscripts who don't want to be there. And she was around the age that their mothers would have been. And so she kind of had this um, implicit authority in dealing with them. And she, she, she says she would sort of put her hand on her hip and be like, young man, you're going to let me cross this <laughs> bridge. And it, and it would work. Um, and she had a couple of sort of near near misses where she, I mean, she socked a guy in Israel who was trying to take her bag and 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 escaped. Um, so it's not like she's 
completely opposed to violence. As she said, uh, I don't, I think she said, God doesn't want us to be marshmallows in, in, in answer to the question of whether or not violence was permitted. Cause I asked, is it theologically forbidden? You know, like, can I carry mace or uh, a baton? Like what would the limit be? <laughs> you know, obviously we don't want a bunch of pilgrims out there packing heat, but. Yeah. That's it. No, that's interesting that she kind of goes back to the, nothing is forbidden. Everything is permitted. Right. <laughs> kind of rule of pilgrimaging. Which right. Is, uh... <laughs> It, it, does that exist because you there's this idea that you're under the Lord's protection or that because you are due or is it more of like a Catholic uh, indulgence thing is that you are making this sacrifice and therefore you are allowed certain sins or is it it's a little bit of both? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it probably has to do with, in her case, really seeing herself in this tradition of saints these high adventure saints, you know, some of whom like Martin is kind of one of her heroes and she did some pilgrimages for him and he was a soldier. And so I think there's an idea of that you should have, you know, I don't think she sees herself as like a soldier out there, like slaying for God, but that you should have that kind of fortitude. So God protects the pilgrims among us, unless he doesn't, in which case, if you get to be martyred, then you get to skip a rung on the road to sainthood and she made no bones about that she was like i was i was like wow you want to be martyred and she was like all catholics worth their salt want to be martyred <laughs> and i don't know anything about catholicism i mean i really knew nothing about catholicism or really pilgrimage before writing this piece so that was kind of amazing to me um, to go back to something you mentioned earlier with Anne and these these young conscripts, you know, you you often compare the role of the mother with the role of the pilgrim. You know, both depend on a, a degree of fantasy and projection, and and you know the right. the idea of bifurcation <laughs> of of, of the yeah. same. So where where do these roles diverge for you? And and do you do you still hold that fantasy of going on a pilgrimage someday? Yeah, I don't think I got over it. I think there's something, I mean, in spite of all the sort of reckoning with myself I did in the writing and all my ulterior motives for wanting to pilgrim, I do still hold the belief that in certain circumstances, there are experiences or encounters that are unavailable to us in any other circumstance. I don't mean like a classical pilgrimage where you walk to a relic and touch it. I just mean this idea of having an unscripted journey where there's road beneath your feet and you're alone and you're not planning your life to the minute. You know, like this experience of sort of putting yourself, putting your life and your fate in in the hands of the world or in the hands of the gods, however you want to frame it, that 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 makes for certain kinds of experiences that I don't think you can find other places. But I wouldn't even call it the consolation, but the uh, the revelation of writing this piece for me was discovering that there are different kinds of singular experiences available to me in this new situation that I wouldn't have been able to access had I not gone ahead and had my son. I feel like a way in which you kind of connect Anne with yourself again, who has this very completely different life from yours is that Anne is also a storyteller and that she has this ability to really captivate audiences with her tales of being on the road. And as you suggest in your essay, pilgrimage itself is a physical form of storytelling. You know, there's this linear progression with organizing symbolism that can lend direction and meaning and purpose when one is feeling directionless. So, so would you likewise compare the pilgrim and the writer who are, you know, seeking a theme, seeking an archetype, seeking a direction, a canvas onto which people can interpret and project meaning? Yes, you're submitting to a, you know, when you're doing a proper pilgrimage, you're submitting to a structure that has a beginning, middle and end that has obstacles it's all but assured that you're going to have some kind of all is lost moment. Like they talk about and save the cat, you know, uh, 
and then you you're going to push through and find the strength to go on like it kind of it it makes it makes it it make it makes some that certain experiences uh certain narrative experiences more likely potentiates is that is am i using that word correctly <laughs> um the interesting thing about Anne as a storyteller though i think is one she she's a prolific writer and it's very it's very engaging it's um yeah, she's written reams and reams. But one of the things that struck me about her early life that um, didn't wind up in the in the essay, but continues to tell me something about her. Uh, when, the, when they were kids, you know, her father was an English professor and he was working on his dissertation, which was on American authors. He packed all the kids into the car and the whole family went on this months long road trip over the summer, visiting the locations where different books had been written. Um, and then he would do research in the local library or whatever. And, um, and the kids, because they didn't have air, air conditioning or anything to really um, occupy them for these long stretches, they would read the books. So they'd like read Hemingway while they were driving through Michigan and Sinclair Lewis in Minnesota and, Huck Finn in Missouri. And then, you know, while dad was researching, they'd occupy themselves with different projects. So her and the siblings built like a raft and took it down the Mississippi for some period. Oh my some God. Of the <laughs> Mississippi. So, dangerous. so <laughs> yeah. So you got this like early adventuring spirit for sure. But then also this notion that, you know, there need not be a barrier between the reader and the story that if you can read it, you can live it. And that's kind of the moral of living into these saint lives. You know, I mean, there's really, there's not much difference in terms of scale, in terms of how epic her life has become. And a lot of these um, saint narratives that she has steeped herself in. Um, and so maybe I have that in common with her to some extent that I, um, grew up reading secular books, but um, maybe developed a kind of um, un somewhat unrealistic idea of what life could be like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, don't we all? Don't we all? And parenthood is a real bitch for that, I gotta say. It's like, you know, even if I sort of viewed myself as pretty realistic about, and I was ambivalent going into the into the process. And yet once I had my son, I recognized how much delusion I had yet to dispel, you know, like mm -hmm. even though I knew it would be hard, it was much, much harder than I expected. And even though I knew I wasn't like necessarily a born mother, whatever that means, like some kind of TV mom, I came up against my own limitations much harder than I had expected. Um, Point being, like, even though you you set out on a five hundred mile hike up mountains, like you you can't <laughs> you don't learn from reading the Reddit how difficult it's going to be. You <laughs> learn by falling down and walking up the mountain and being sore and you know like wondering why the fuck you did this and then having the ecstatic release later on. You know, yeah. There's this very neoliberal notion of quote working on yourself that something like motherhood or pilgrimage completely defies yeah and that no matter how much even if you've completely rejected that narrative of working on yourself you you're still unprepared fundamentally for those experiences right one of the really refreshing things about Anne is that she is she really sort of approaches her job you know she worked in nuclear remediation for a long time and they wanted to promote her to be more of a, you know, managerial type. And she didn't have any interest in it. She wanted to be running her crew, following them into danger and like having boots on the ground. That was always what she was interested in. Otherwise she, as she framed it, she would felt bored. Mm -hmm. So her approach to pilgrimage is very workmanlike, you know, I think early on I'd asked her about, what she was doing while she was walking, you know, are you, are you in prayer? You know, the old, the old um, way of the pilgrim, he's, 
he's repeating this just Jesus's name over and over again, you know, like, do you have a mantra? Are you talking to God? And I forget what other high minded things I, I offered. And she was like, no, I'm usually like, trying to figure out if I'm on track with my compass and have I adequately hydrated and how many kilometers are left and what's my plan B if somebody doesn't answer the door. So she's, she really views herself as a worker for her God. She's out there providing the opportunity for people to take her in and you know, sharing her stories along the way and building trust and, you know, all of the other ways in which she frames her purpose on earth. But it's not, um, again, it's not very (laughs) spiritual, quote unquote, you know? For you, where does the spirituality come in? I mean, there's obviously the, you know, there's this level of, you know, archetype, but then there's also this level of, you know, practicality is is that is balancing that the 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 true like you've mastered pilgrimage i think maybe that's the crux of the whole thing for me is this idea that that it can be a gift to let go of the romantic story so that you can with clear eyes encounter the reality the embodied reality of your situation. Mm. So in terms of Anne, that's, you know, the very, the physically brutalizing work of doing these pilgrimages and, um, you know, throwing herself on the mercy of her fellow man. (laughs) And, and for me, like letting go of the fantasy I had about what it would mean to be a parent and the, you know, and being honest with myself about what all of my own explorations were about. And I think they were about different things, but certainly sometimes they were about just cutting tack and running so that I didn't have to deal with the fallout of being in relationship or being in having to stay in one place. And I don't even want to like put a bow on it and say that when you do that, there, you know, there's a different kind of enlightenment. You know, people talk a lot about the inner, the inner Camino. And I'm sure that's true for some people, but I guess the, the kind of unstated question for me is, can I, can I um, apply my energies to nurturing and growing this person without there being some highfalutin extra meaning beyond the unfolding reality that is the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I I think that's really insightful because it, like every sometimes it feels like everything is like a college essay where it's like and this is how I learned this. <laughs> right. And this is why this thing I did is actually really important and it, I mean how, you can't live your life like that. Right. Like sometimes something is nothing. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> and it's fine. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes sometimes the shit in the diaper is just that. That's all it is, you know. Yes, it's not. Um, it's not a metaphor. No. <laughs> yeah, and I and I love psychoanalysis, dude. Like I'm willing to talk all about the you know excretions of our psyches and stuff. But sometimes it's just the poo poo. <laughs> and uh, yes, exactly. Don't you think that's kind of a way of people asking you to account for yourself, Violet? Like you know. Yeah. That's the whole premise Absolutely. of the college essay like what you know and therefore why do you get to live <laughs> yeah what's your value exactly. what's, your, what's your value to this institution um yeah the other obvious parallel between pilgrimage and motherhood is that it's personal but it's not private so yeah how do you <laughs> you know i mean how do you think about this and do you feel like this in some way is similar to writing as well, because, you know, you've written a memoir, which is personal, but not private. Well, you're submitting yourself to the group. I mean, uh, and they're going to have their reaction. They're going to invite you in or cast you out, you know? Um, And there's, and you just, you have to relinquish control. That's probably... That's probably the way that the the two map onto one another the the 
the most succinctly for me is the really relinquishing of of control the first thought that came to my mind was a recent experience at the park that we go to where my kid was having a rough afternoon hadn't slept and was in a bad mood and um, pitched a genuine like meltdown fit in front of everybody which is not an uncommon experience i don't think for a lot of parents but when it's happening and you're on the clock um it's it's hard not to feel like embarrassed or that you've failed in some way or another and um people are noticing you in the way oh that yeah everybody turned it, it was like the matrix like all the heads turned you know <laughs> um <laughs> And uh, I would say that probably the healthiest uh, ego adjustment of this experience has been um, checking a lot of the superiority that I had about my own, like what, how I expected I would perform as a parent in relation to how I felt my parents underperformed mm -hmm. or you know, didn't perform in the ways that I wanted them to. It's not like you need to be humbled in a way that makes you lesser but that makes you of a proper size or something like it's humbling. And this is sort, sort of what I wonder it might be the benefit of religion. Like if I could believe, which is doubtful, but um, mm. this idea of, of sort of being of scale. So like you're not the most important person in the world. And I dealt with this a lot in my believers book too. Like when we're talking about such overwhelming crises as we face ecologically and with climate, it's important to know that you're not solely responsible for turning around the calamity, you know, and also not just throwing in the towel and saying, fuck it, but like being able to adequate, like accurately appraise your capacities. And, um, and I feel like I'm offered a daily lesson in that. Right. This, the, as you, as you said, this essay could have gone so many different directions because Anne has walked through war zones. She has done so many, she's walked so many miles just around the globe and, and put herself in, the, had so many different experiences that are unique and you could have just unpacked three and it would have been uh, like a whole, <laughs> like a whole essay about that. So I guess, how did you when you are trying to break this down into a narrative that you know reflects these different these different aspects of life of of existing in the world of of feeling that you know feeling the numinous how did you how did you go about structuring it <laughs> well i can't really take credit for that i think that's all matthew Sherrill, um who edited the piece up until he took flight <laughs> rest in peace yes. Matt. Um, <laughs> but we all love Matt. <laughs> he was actually yeah he's great he he was actually the one who invited so much personal content which is interesting because normally I'm trying to insert myself because it's the one subject that I feel like I can you know at ease speak at length about without having to you know provide a lot of fact checking information <laughs> but in this case it, there was so much about Anne. i wanted and he was the one who kind of pulled in uh my story which i it ended up being a write around obviously because i did, i couldn't go on pilgrimage with her um but i hope the kind of write around that you know is at home with its subject because of course that's the whole thing it's constraint you know and what is born of of constraint whether you're the constraint is um, I'm walking 45 kilometers today or, uh, I had a kid, so whoops, I can't actually go on an epic three month journey. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I was, it was a, it was something I really struggled with. So he, he helped me figure that one out. There was a lot that, cause for, I kind of geek out on the gear and, and stuff like, First of all, she, oh, her clothes sound amazing. Yeah, and that's not even the half of it, man. She's got so many cool. She showed me. She just like pulled out all her, all her gear and showed me all of the ways in which it could be expanded or contracted or cinched and all these hidden pockets and, you know, the various levels of how the material is, um, you know, um, 
like this hoodie, the, the medieval tunic thing is a multi-tool really, because she often sleeps in these cold churches or crypts where you need to keep warm one, but they don't have a pillow and she doesn't pack anything. So she would take off her day clothes and pack it into her hood, her oversized hood, and that would serve as a pillow. And, you know, it was just fucking ingenious stuff. And then, you know, all the, of course, my interest runs toward like the physical impacts of living this way. You know, what about blisters and corns and all of these things? She claims to have soft pink feet and even offered to take off her boots. And she loves a foot rub, she added. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, so I took her word for it on that one, but, um, you know, she's the, she peed black for three days without well, ended up in the article and she wound up because her rule of thumb is she'll allow herself to have an extreme illness for three days before seeking medical care. And so far she's never had to do it. Um, uh, yeah. So on the fourth day she arose and she was <laughs> fine. Um, but she had a, you know, when she was walking from the tip of South America to Mexico city, she was walking with the sun in her face. Um, at one point, you know, the, the angles shifted and it was in her face all day and it was under her hat brim and she burned the shit out of her lip. Um, and she said it was like oozy goo. It was just like falling off, but she doesn't believe in, I mean, she believes in sunscreen, but she thinks it's often misused. She had kind of a long story about it. So she doesn't carry it. And, um, and so she was scavenging these little, uh, remnants of candles from the monasteries where she was staying and, and getting them warm and then shaping them into a kind of oh. shield, which she would wear around Whoa. her face to protect it. That's so um, yeah, she, <laughs> it's so metal. And she'd come up, she came home from that walk after 11 months, so emaciated that she had, um, she was a double zero. Whoa. And this is a person who's not like a, skinny mini and uh and lost all of her upper body strength but again you know i think because she's so devoted to this she's devoted to the sacrifice she's made that she really wasn't too worried about it she's like i really what i need are my my legs to be strong because that's my main bag is walking so i'm not too worried about having lost my upper arm strength you know so i mean you could just go on and on she's had so many near scrapes and this is an extremely boring question but it has it has been nagging at me um so how does money work i think it's important to ask because how does she get a plane ticket how does she you know and so as as she explained it to me sometimes people will be so moved by because she does give these talks like she crashes for some period of the year at a friend's house in denver usually like a month um where she resoles her boots and kind of recovers and she'll give talks at churches and like, you know, community groups and people will donate miles like frequent flyer miles oh. and she'll get a plane ticket that way or people will donate money. Um, so, and then, you know, at some point it became required basically that she have a bank card because this is how they verify your identity in Europe in various situations, but especially so in COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so that totally altered her, her mode because she had to have a smartphone with her and she had to have a bank card because everyone, everyone went cashless. And um, I don't know that like she, her, her take on that was it's really not great to have these fetters, but um but also pilgrims have been adapting to all kinds of social and political situations for, you know, millennia. So um, you got to kind of roll with it. We are limited by the limitations of this physical world. <laughs> but our spirits exactly, are unbound. Yeah. That's the important takeaway. Right. Unbound. <laughs> that's, that's the end of my college essay. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thanks for wrapping it up. Can we get a little like the more you know sound effect? Actually, I'll just put organ music. Very loud. Organ oh, good. Music. Well, I thank you for the gift of your presence and humanity. Oh, Violet. Th thank you. Thank you for this essay. <laughs> 
You've been listening to the Harper's Magazine podcast, produced by Violet Luca and Madeline Crum, with production assistance by Ian Montgani. The music is Cut and Shoot by Febrifuge. Harper's Magazine is the oldest general interest monthly in America, exploring the issues that drive our national conversation through long-form narrative journalism and essays. To get 12 issues for $21.97, visit harpers.org slash save.